Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the joint work with uh, Yelena Knyazeva, Thomas Lavergne, and François Yvon, Abdelimsi, about predicting the target morphology when we want to translate into a morphologically rich language. In our case, uh, Czech. So I'll first uh, describe the problem, the main problem of generating target morphology uh, in the output. Then I will talk about our, uh, the model we've decided to work on uh, and the experience we had in the past. And then I'm going to do different, well, I'm going to present, introduce different experiments we've been uh, doing uh, to better understand uh, the, um, to better understand actually mixed results that we had in the past. So here is the situation. Uh, when you translate into a morphologically rich language from English, which is a morphologically poor language, uh, you uh, have huge problem due to problems due to dissymmetry of both languages. Uh, for example, you see that uh, actually the, the, verb, the Czech verb pojedu actually encodes three words in English, I will go. And it's uh, typically the same thing also with uh, nouns, where uh, the meaning encoded in an English preposition is actually encoded in a Czech ending, ending of a noun. And you also have a, a free order in Czech also. So uh, for example, the fact that uh, Jan loves Hannah, uh, Hannah is the beloved one. And we know this uh, looking at the ending of Hannah, which is anu, means object, uh, object case. And then you can put Hannah and Jan in as many order as you, as you can possibly imagine. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know that Hannah is the one do, that is being loved. Uh, so in this situation, yeah, this lack of symmetry actually, actually makes the work of generated check uh, on the target side a lot harder. Um, another th hard thing to do is actually when you have, for example, uh, one uh, an adjective in the source side and you want to generate a translation. So you have beautiful in English and you want to try to find a translation for beautiful. And this is all the uh, word forms you, well, have to uh, choose among. Krasny, krasneho, krasnemu, krasnem. So one first thing is that, one first problem is that, of course, on the target side, you have many sparsity issues and you have many OVs. For example, you've seen uh, krasneho many times, but krasnemu, not a single time. So uh, if you need to generate it, actually, it's a big problem because you haven't seen it at training time. And if you have seen it like Krasnemu like 10 times or I don't know, five times in the training data, actually uh, it is pretty hard to estimate the uh, proper probability for a word that was very infrequent in the training data. So that's a problem. So the basic idea, uh, it was an idea uh, that was uh, proposed at first in 2012 by Fraser, Alexander Fraser. Uh, is to just say, okay, so uh, check is too complicated, let's, let's make it more simple. So we have all those word forms and we're just uh, gonna transform check in order to make it more parallel or more symmetric to English and say, okay, we have krasny, krasnimi, krasny, we'll just now have krasn, and that's it. And uh, so the idea is uh, actually that when you uh, make this normalization of the check, uh, of the Czech language, it should make the translation process easier um, since the um, empty system doesn't have to make too hard choices. But the thing is that there, are, uh, there were many unsuccessful attempts. Uh, so we had uh, those two first examples, the two first papers, it's uh, Marion Veller, uh, which works with uh, Alexander Fraser, and the two last ones are our attempts. Uh, in different language pairs, as you see, well, always from English, but in two different languages. And um, we got really sometimes, well, in the base case, we actually did the same score as the baseline. That's in the base case. In the worst case, it was a lot worse. And uh, it's kind of, it was kind of frustrating, and we actually didn't really understand why it didn't work, because sometimes it does work, and even uh, the guys who invented it actually cannot make it work sometimes. And it was very frustrating because we really wanted to make it work. Our first attempt was at WMT15. Uh, we translated, yeah, from English into Russian and it just didn't work. It performed very, very bad. And we kind of wanted to uh, understand why does it actually sometimes work and why does it not work sometimes? So we've run different experiments. So here is how uh, the two-step MT works. 
So first of all, uh, as I said, you normalize the check data. So the target data, uh, target side of parallel data and the monolingual data. Uh, so where we have each word here, for example, the noun autem, that is represented as a lemma and a sequence of tag, a tags, morphological tags. And normalizing the check data simply consists in removing tags that are supposed to be redundant with respect to English. So here in this situation, we have the instrumental tag or instrumental case, and we decided to remove it. So in that situation, when you did that, you actually start training your, uh, your empty system, and you have a system that translates from English into this normalized check that looks pretty much like this. Uh, but when you have your output, so your output is in normalized check and it's not enough, you need to do some further post-processing in order to retrieve the correct morphology and the correct word forms. Uh, so here is how it works. So we previously dropped instrumental case that a normalization step as a pre-processing step. Now we need to uh, retrieve it in the output. And once we have retrieved it, we use so the lemma and the tag sequence from the empty output and the tags that we have predicted. And we just go look, look up in a dictionary and generate the correct word form given the tags and the lemma. So here is the normalization of a check that we did. So basically, we decided to normalize uh, mainly nouns, adjectives, pronouns, and uh, that's it. We decided, for example, not to normalize verbs uh, because verb actually verbs, uh, when you normalize verbs, actually you lose a lot of information that is uh, critical to make the right prediction for case, for example. When you want to uh, predict, when you need to predict the subject case of a noun, it's very important to know the inflection of the verb. So we decided to keep it, and basically we uh, removed three types of tags, three uh, grammatical or morphological categories. It's gender, number, and case. So uh, in the second step, uh, we need to reinflect the uh, to predict the to predict the uh, tags that were previously dropped, and we have three three strategies for that. So the first one is uh, using a language model. So basically, what you have is <coughs> sorry, a lemma and a sequence of tags from the empty output, and you use that to generate the full paradigm of the uh, word. So all the words form corresponding to the uh, lemma and tags. And you just uh, let the language model choose the most likely form uh, given the context. The second strategy is to use a, a, a sequence of CRF models. And um, so each model predicts uh, one attribute, first gender, then number, then case. And then in the last step, we have a joint prediction of all those three attributes. And each of uh, these model has access to the uh, output of the previous model. So when you want to predict case, you actually look at what, what you can, the CRF has access to what was previously predicted um, as gender and number. And the third uh, strategy was, uh, is a greedy sequence label. So it's an SVM uh, classifier that does a greedy search. So once we've predicted uh, the missing tags for the CRF and the greedy model, uh, what we need to do is to, as I said, uh, given a lemma and a tag sequence, generate the right word form. And sometimes in Czech, uh, not sometimes, but all the time, pretty much, uh, when you have predicted all the tags, you still have ambiguities because you have different word forms with exact, the exact same lemma and same analysis. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. And for that, uh, we just use a Unigram um, model that's actually, uh, that was trained on the uh, in-domain data <coughs> and uh, simply took the most frequent form in uh, the in-domain data. So uh, what we did mainly in those experiments is that we wanted to understand the impact of the data size uh, on the results. Uh, so before I introduce the results, uh, here, are, here is our setup. So we have uh, results for ENCODE system, which is an NGRAM-based uh, statistical machine translation system, and MOSES for contrast. Uh, we use 4-gram KNLMs and uh, MIRA optimization. Here is the data we have used. So uh, we have uh, 
been exploring two uh, spaces somehow. Uh, the growing monolingual data, so how do blue score, how is blue score affected by growing monolingual data, and in the second step, how it is affected by growing, uh, I'm sorry, first growing parallel data and then monolingual data growing. <coughs> and here are the results. Uh, so as we see, the greedy model always performs uh, better than any other models. Um, and the CRF actually performs slightly worse, but it's pretty much the same thing. One thing to know here is that the language model used to disambiguate the paradigm generated in the second step uh, is trained on the target side of the parallel data. So it's uh, trained on very, very small uh, data. So uh, we here had uh, results with uh, Moses on the top and below ENCODE. And we see that ENCODE performs a little better than Moses. Here, is, uh, the, here are the results with growing monolingual data. So on the left side, you have the quantity of uh, monolingual sentences used to train the language model. And um, what we see here is that this greedy model is still uh, the best, but the, as the amount of monolingual data grows, the improvement gets uh, lower. And until finally, uh, for both Moses and ENCODE, uh, the reinflection actually makes the baseline, performs worse than the baseline. And we see that the um, language model disambiguation uh, performs even better than the CRF models or any classifier, CRF or greedy. So here is how it looks like when it's plotted. It's maybe a little, a, a little easier to read that, so yeah. On the left side, we have uh, growing parallel data. And uh, we see uh, that, yeah, we see that the greedy uh, and, uh, and CRF models are a lot higher than the baseline still. But on the right side, uh, what we see, yeah, we pretty much see uh, wh what I said. So you have the uh, performance of the English to check, which is the baseline, so it's the direct. English to check translation that keeps growing better. And the uh, classifiers actually uh, perform worse. And uh, the only way to improve, actually, the translation is to use the language model disambiguation. So how to, I mean, is that it? Is that, uh, is that all we can do? I mean, we have tried to uh, take advantage of larger data. And here is uh, how we did. So the thing is that uh, when you do reinflection with the one best hypothesis from the empty uh, system, you always work with a fixed set of words and a fixed order. So sometimes whatever reinflection you do, whatever prediction the CRF made, the uh, sentence is already bad. So it generated, for example, a wrong verbal construction, a wrong preposition, and there's nothing to do there. So when you start exploring the uh, end best space uh, from the decoder, output. Uh, there you can actually uh, consider different uh, constructions and the CRF can make better predictions and uh, take advantage of it. So those, uh, what we do is uh, we still have a system that translates from English into normalized check unless this time it outputs the n best uh, hypothesis, in our case 300 best hypothesis. Those 300, each one of these uh, 300 best hypotheses are rescored using, using different models, and then are, uh, I'm sorry, uh, they are firstly reinflected and then rescored. That's how it works, using Myra. Uh, so we use two kinds of LMs. The main results uh, I'm going to introduce now is uh, based on uh, the rescoring with n-gram, an n-gram LM, a can LM. Uh, but we also have results, and actually our submission at IWSLT MT track uh, this year uh, was with the neural LM uh, with character-based word representation that you may have seen if you came to my poster yesterday. Um, yes, we also take the K-best CRF predictions, and that turns out to help also. So when the MT uh, decoder generates N-best lists, for each uh, hypothesis, the CRF generates the five best hypotheses. So we end up with 300 times five uh, hypotheses. And here are the results. Uh, so what we see here is that, uh, of course, as the, uh, 
so, so that's, yeah, that's, uh, uh, we still can get a little more improvement, but uh, at the, uh, by the end, which you see when you, um, the, monolingual, the monolingual data contains 200 uh, million sentences, the improvement is not so good, but it's still something. Um, and here are the results, by the way, uh, that we got at IWSLT uh, this year at the empty track. And we can see that uh, actually this system <coughs> corresponds to <coughs> I'm sorry, 885k sentences, parallel data, and uh, with 200 million uh, monolingual sentences for the language model. So we can see here that on the TED test uh, sets, we uh, still got a pretty good improvement. Here is the plot representing uh, so, uh, uh, the difference between the one best and the NK best predictions. Uh, so what we see is that when we have a, a very low amount of parallel data, uh, actually generating the one best or the n best doesn't make any difference. But as the amount of uh, data parallel or even monolingual grows, uh, the difference between one best and nk best gets uh, bigger. Uh, it gets bigger and uh, that is a good thing because uh, the NK best actually still outperforms the baseline, the English to check baseline, while the one best uh, makes actually performs worse. And uh, what we see here is a small example in Czech. Uh, as I told you, sometimes you generate, well, the one best hypothesis is just a bad construction. So here you have budu ti obeit. So budu obeit is actually ungrammatical. It's, uh, I'll, so the it's a future tense that is made with a perfective verb, and it would sound in English like uh, you want to say, I will do it, and you say, I will did it. Uh, so the CRF had to predict uh, some case for the pronoun, you, and it predicted dative case, maybe because it thought it was some, the, the, uh, the idea was uh, some, some modal meaning. Uh, but in the NK best space, it, was able to find actually the right construction with an imperfective verb, and the CIF was able to make the right prediction, with it, which is accusative case. Budutier <coughs> opraset. So um, we wanted to figure out here yeah, pretty much what's going on actually, and why is the translation getting uh, a lot better with the one best prediction? And here is what we did. So uh, basically, each time, we, each time we computed a blue score, we also uh, got a blue score with the normalized reference translation. So you just normalize the reference translation, and you have your, out, your empty outputs in uh, normalized check, and you just compute the uh, blue score. And uh, here is, uh, are the differences uh, between the baseline, so direct English to check translation, and the different setups. Uh, so you see that the one best, the <coughs> you, what we see, first of all, is that when you uh, run the blue score over the normalized reference, the improvement when you have low data uh, is above four blue points, which is a good, pretty good improvement, considering that we, for example, didn't do any normalization for uh, verbs and uh, we only selected a few parts of speech. Uh, but as when you have a big monolingual data, the improvement is barely above, uh, barely up to three blue points. And that's uh, actually not very big space for improvement. And we see that uh, both NK best and one best uh, predictions uh, are getting lower as the uh, uh, data grows. So, in conclusions, what do these uh, experiments show? Well, uh, it shows that reflection is more effective in low resource conditions. Well, that's something we could expect, actually. Uh, it shows that it's a little less effective, of course, when you have uh, big, big data and vast amounts of monolingual data available. Uh, but um, it turns out that um, a language, a simple language model, is actually uh, helping better than any fancy CRF model or anything else. Um, so uh, that's it. And the thing is that even uh, with when we have a not very high uh, improvement in terms of blue, with a big mm, system, 
we still see many words uh, in the output that were actually not seen at training time. So we have 6.82% of word types that were not seen, seen during the training. So uh, it still, still, still seems that the model is able to take advantage of, uh, uh, of reinflection anyway. So the conclusion is that uh, there is a right model for each data setup. So depending on the quantity of data that you have. Uh, so for example, uh, Marion Veller in 2013 got no improvement with the CRF reinflection on English to French. But uh, it was, a, as you see, a big model with many mm, parallel sentences. <clears throat> and maybe she should have tried uh, and best reinflection, which turned out to work for us in Czech. Uh, the same for us, for our experiments in Russian in 2015. Uh, we should have actually tried to uh, do some end best reinflection also. And interestingly, uh, the uh, um, basic paper, the initial paper from Alexander Fraser in 2012 I talked about, uh, shows no improvement uh, reinflating the end best list. And uh, this is now something we understand because the quantity of data is quite low. So future work. What we plan to do now with this, because now we understand a little more how uh, we are able to predict a little more the, 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 the quality of uh, reinflection, we want to uh, run um, uh, an automatic uh, normalization because the way we normalize the Czech data is just basically thinking about the Czech language and thinking how hard it is compared to English and thinking, okay, what do we need to remove? And we don't want, it's, of course, it makes it suboptimal. And what we want is some automatic way to actually find the optimal normalization in order to take advantage of, uh, uh, of a very clean normalization to actually improve the translation process. <clears throat> Uh, what we ideally would like to do is uh, lower the dependency on human informed resource quality, like taggers and dictionary, because of, of course all this depends on the, on the quality of the tools that you have, and that's a big problem. Because, for example, we've made experiments on Romanian, and it didn't give any improvement because we had, unfortunately didn't have uh, uh, the right tools. And, of course, as Jan said, when you do SMT, uh, how does reinflection perform with new LMT? And that's, uh, that's a question we uh, we're asking because basically uh, neural MT is well known to uh, generate a very fluent output even in morphologically rich languages and the space we had for improvement with SMT is actually a lot lower with NMT so um, but maybe somehow actually um, we can generate a correct morphology but the normalization will be help helpful for NMT we don't know we have no idea we will do that in the future thank you very much for your attention Any questions, comments? Thank you very much for this talk. This was, I, I especially liked your idea with the um, reinflection of the unbest list, because I worked a couple of years ago on a very similar problem, actually based on much earlier work, because I think Christina Tutanova already worked on that a couple of years before Alex Fraser. With, yes, and in she 2008, had, indeed, yeah. Yeah, it was 2009 at least, or earlier even. Um, and. Also, I also tried this, and I didn't come up with the and best list thing, which is a really good idea. But I see two problems with this, what you're doing. First of all, I think you have a training data mismatch, because you're training on ideal data, and you're trying to apply it to machine translation output. And I just say, this is the reason why this doesn't really work. Um, I mean, you do get some improvement, but I'd still, still say that this is not something which I would call it works. And the second problem is um, blue and check. No, um, blue and, and inflective languages in general is a catastrophe in my opinion because um, you might get higher blue while if you show the result to an actual Czech speaker, he might tell you it's worse because mm -hmm. um, you might hit the right inflected forms according to the reference, but it, it's very possible that you actually broke apart the fluency of the sentence and um, a Czech reader might be very unhappy with that. I did, these were my experiences with Polish. I even did an experiment where I um, used the reference as an oracle for choosing the inflected form. Blue went up by three to five points, but the sentence was totally unreadable, mm -hmm. despite keeping the lemmas as a fixed point. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so ba basically the idea, indeed, uh, choosing blue as a metric to uh, measure the quality of a morphology is not the best way to go, of course, but basically the first intention was uh, to compare our improvement, the improvement we got with other uh, experiments that were done in the past by us and by other people, uh, as I said. So blue is always, it's basically the reason why we're all using blue today is because we can compare with uh, other people. Yes, but and what the I'm second saying is for check, you probably cannot compare. You're for getting improvements, but I'm not sure you're actually getting improvements. This is what I'm saying. Uh, so you don't really know, oh, whatever we do in this kind of work, I, I would say we don't know what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. For English, sure. Or, or if you've got, I don't know, if you've got an improvement of five blue points, then I'd say, yeah, you definitely got an improvement. When you're in the area of one blue point for Polish, Russian, Czech, especially in this morphology thing, um, be very cautious. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, in the future anyway, we plan to do some uh, more fine-grained analysis. And this was just, uh, I hope you understood that, this was just yeah. uh, like a, 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 our goal was just to understand what's going on. I mean, how, are the, how come the results are so unpredictable? And we just wanted to find out how this all works and make a fresh start to actually uh, work further in that area. Uh, in the area of target morphology. So yeah, we'll definitely use uh, different uh, ways to, 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 to. And have you thought about the training data mismatch? Did you do something there? Uh, the training data mismatch is of course very important. If it might explain actually the uh, quite um, on the right side, the green line that is not very uh, beautiful. It may be because of course it's the language model disambiguation and it depends on the uh, domain adaptation level of the data used to train the language model, I guess. And that explains some drops and uh, like not clear lines. And um, yeah, of course, we're very well aware that uh, the type of data actually uh, uh, has a very big impact on the overall quality of the system. But maybe on reinflection, I don't know. On reinflection, it's hard to tell actually. But for example, yeah, the biggest uh, monolingual data we had uh, was we obtained by adding actually many, many uh, sentences from the common crawl corpus the huge common crawl corpora, corpora that were uh, given yeah. at WMT this year. But that's not even what I mean. I mean, the problem is not so much that you are out of domain. The problem is that you are training on actual human data, while you are trying to correct machine translation output, which is very different from the data you trained on. Ah, I'm sorry, that's what you meant. Yeah, ah, that's, okay. that's what oh, I mean, I'm sorry. data mismatch. Yeah. And what you should maybe try to um, choose, I don't know, and examples from an best list and try to train on that. Mm -hmm. uh, just a suggestion, I don't know. Yeah, well, train on that. It means that first of all, the output is ungrammatical uh, generally, yeah, and then what you want, what you what you can do is actually run a tagger over it, um, automatic analysis. Uh, but since the output is ungrammatical, it won't give anything actually. But from anything. a large and best list, you could choose the best sentence according to a reference, like the oracle sentence, yeah, and then train on the improved one. Maybe I, I don't know, because otherwise, he, th this is what I mean with the train, and this is what, in my opinion, why it didn't work when I was experimenting with that. Because mm -hmm. I got perfect scores, 90 something percent reconstruction quality on the original data. Mm -hmm. But when I tried this on machine translation output, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, our CRF and uh, the greedy sequence level models are trained on the UDT, Universal Dependency Tree Bank. And, yeah, of course, it's very fluent uh, data, and that might be. Actually, Alexander Fraser trains these, uh, the classifiers he uses on the uh, monolingual data, if I'm not, on the, uh, I'm sorry, parallel data, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I think he found a way to introduce some, a few mistakes and make like a few synthetic uh, sentences that might be more, well, closer to the empty output. But uh, actually there is no clear comparison with that yet. Mm -hmm. it needs to be investigated also, of course. Other questions? <clears throat> Hi, uh, can I ask you, have you tried to drop even more information from the sentences, even for in the verbs? And as you said that uh, for the verbs it doesn't work, so have you tried different cases or just the three information you dropped? Uh, basically, what we've tried is uh, we have tried dropping information from verbs for Russian uh, one and a half years ago, and it's 
that ended in tears. Uh, and so this year, no, for this, we haven't uh, tried any further normalization. But uh, again, it's again for future work since we're going to do some automatic normalization so we cannot predict, like say, just remove case. Uh, it's gonna be more complicated, definitely. So, which will make actually the prediction step or the reflection step harder. But, Thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Okay. Okay, let's thank speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you.